world. The energy turnaround and digitization to us are two sides of the same coin. Digitization bears an enormous potential to really integrate different sectors and also to tackle climate change. And uh, this is true for both the energy turnaround and the mobility turnaround. Uh, turnaround. When we look at the energy turnaround, we can see that IT applications in the area of mobility uh, can make a great ecologic contribution. The potential in Germany alone is 190 million tons of CO2 that can be saved and with smart grids and intelligent housing technology we can make great and promising investments and we can also uh, use intelligent IT solutions when it comes to feeding in the energy generated by renewables uh, into the existing uh, grid. And let me just mention with Lignite Fired Power Station, the control demand through intelligent IT solutions is rather limited. And I think the greatest potential lies in the energy turnaround with this decentrally and fluctuating, fluctuating power generation. That's, we have quite good situation. Uh, in this area, when we don't have district heating, we have a good potential to use geothermal uh, energy. So it's like yin yang. You have 80% which comes from the district heating and you, that makes you a uh, good effect and but you, you may not reach the goal if you not add this 20%. We might be from renewable energy sources. So district heating, waste to energy, it was also uh, 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 mentioned by, uh, uh, by previous speaker, but what is also very important to decarbonize uh, the production of the energy in our cities. What we decided to, uh, 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 to launch in 2013, it was uh, a huge program. It was an effect of one of European programs which we have with our uh, sister cities from the uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, southern part of our continent. It was to introduce into, into the city the renewable energy strategy uh, um, uh, for the energy production. And the main point of this renewable energy uh, action plan was, firstly, just to show this map that, I, uh, that you saw on the recent slides, to show to our citizens you have a potential to produce the renewable energy for your houses, but also to give them the grants, to incentivize them to have the next change. And here you, here you can see an effect. In the first, in first year of the granting scheme which we launched for our citizens, we, uh, the, one individual house can get uh, even 10,000 10, of euro per one household to, uh, to photovoltaic, uh, heating pump or uh, uh, any other uh, renewable energy solution. In 2013 we have six applications. In 2017 we have now the very uh, huge number, even uh, uh, 600 of the application. Totally, we spent uh, in this very short time 3.5 million of euro for granting our citizens, for incentivizing them to exchange the uh, renewable energy. It's, but there is only one assumption. We are financing only those installations which is out of the range of the district heating. Just to not make the competition between the uh, renewable energy sources and the heating system. Why? Because heating system is helping us also to keep the uh, electricity balance, electricity uh, 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 strategy. We, they also serve us as a production of the of the uh, of the energy. Housing is of course uh, crucial when it comes to being a climate neutral uh, city. Fifty percent of our CO2 emissions come from the building sector and the housing sector, and this is why this is of course a key uh, to becoming a climate neutral city. In order to make the progress here, we need a simple uh, twofold strategy, which uh, nevertheless is difficult to implement. It consists firstly of energy efficient uh, supply by heat pump um, uh, CHP uh, stations and making sure that the industry is more climate friendly. But also, on the other hand, we have to reduce the heat losses in buildings. Um, and that uh, refers directly to uh, the construction of buildings and to the uh, um, retrofitting of buildings with regard to energy efficiency. And with a view to a social city, we must make sure that the increase in rent is still um, 
affordable to people with uh, a weaker social background, let's put it that way. So I'm grateful to see that once again we've earmarked funds in our budget to retrofit buildings and of course it now depends on including the energy efficient goals uh, in our retrofitting activities and at the same time keeping the rent increase at an affordable level. And this is also the reason why uh, we suggested to have a special service center as a concrete outcome of the project. Such a service center could step in very early on in the phase of planning the retrofitting and construction of energy efficient buildings and they could assess where, how and when an energy efficient retrofitting or construction is possible and the service center would then look at technical data, property structures, funding possibilities, possibilities to get grants or other finances and uh, to put the project on a very solid foundation and to also raise uh, funds, for instance, from the uh, KFW for the energetic retrofitting of cities. This could then accelerate the retrofitting and construction activities. The energy transition policy in Mexico is part of a twofold approach. On the one hand, it's about involving the private sector. And secondly, we have created a dedicated office that is in charge of coordinating all the different policies and also implementing the measures that are a part of the energy transition. A couple of weeks ago, some legal initiatives were implemented in our city. And they mean that the energy transition is now officially a public object political objective. We've created the institutional framework, which means that there is now an institution or an office in place that will coordinate all the different measures. And it's not that we're starting from scratch. Mexico has been working on energy efficiency before that. But the projects were very scattered and they were all initiated by the government and it mainly concerned the infrastructure owned by the city. Now the goal is to work with private businesses and involve them in the strategy. The goal is that all the measures to increase energy efficiency will become a joint task of both the private and the public sector. Uh, the idea is to commit for 20% uh, GHG uh, emissions reduction uh, by the year of 2020. Um, that's not going to be uh, easy to do, but we're going to combine uh, uh, efforts with uh, 15 uh, cities around Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv itself, uh, the municipal uh, borders, only uh, include uh, uh, about half a million, but we are a metropolitan area of about 3 million, so uh, this cooperation uh, together gives us uh, a good amount of, uh, of inhabitants to work with and also houses. Um, we're working together with them on, uh, on the waste management, um, the development of, uh, of the open spaces, the, the green areas, um, uh, the energy uh, reduction uh, and conservation uh, in buildings, and uh, also the, uh, the transport uh, issue. Uh, we're trying to, uh, to create alternatives. We uh, figured that we can create about 60 uh, megawatts uh, with uh, solar energy using uh, rooftops of both uh, uh, public and, and private uh, uh, buildings. Um, the idea is to, uh, we, we already have uh, like a foundation um, uh, giving a one-stop shop for, uh, for uh, houses. Um, people, uh, uh, landlords are uh, um, um, uh, congregate, congregating together, uh, turning to the to the city foundation. The foundation is uh, is like it's a it's a real company, professional. They're helping them choose uh, contractors and to renovate their renovate their houses and and uh, giving them loans uh, uh, for uh, for like five or eight years. 
and they can pay uh, with uh, slowly with payments, which is making it more affordable, especially for the uh, less privileged uh, people the, uh, with less means. The idea is to duplicate that uh, system to a uh, um, to the solar uh, roof, the, the roof solar panels, and to, um, uh, to support uh, uh, houses and support people that want to uh, add uh, these uh, uh, solar panels to their, their rooftops and make it more af affordable. The idea is, I think uh, um, it's the one that is working here in uh, Berlin, is that um, people will have their solar panels on the uh, rooftops and they, they will be um, uh, connected not to the national grid or the local of uh, all the city grid, but uh, only to the building and serving uh, as a re replacement to their um, uh, traditional um, um, uh, electricity bills. So we develop a model um, that um, we, we call the Yes a Citizen Motion model uh, that basically identify the 10 key areas that pretty much any city of any size should look at when thinking about how to transform the city into a more sustainable, connected, innovative, and uh, promoting social cohesion uh, type of cities. And here you have the, the 10 different dimensions that goes from economy to human capital, to social cohesion, uh, public management, technology, mobility and transportation, uh, etc. So the, basically trying to cover what, what we call the value chain of, of a city and we try to measure this over the last four years. If you go to this website here you can download the report, it's an 80 page report. Uh, you can see the ranking uh, but more than the ranking I think what, what is very interesting and what we offer is an interactive map where you can uh, compare any pair of cities out of the 180 cities that we are considering in this, uh, in this uh, ranking. What is interesting about comparing cities is that you can identify what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of your own city and then decide which is your reference city, the city that you wanna uh, resemble and then see how good or bad you're doing. So for instance here, who are we, urban learners? From A to Z means eight cities, mainly capitals, and you see them here on the map. Um, and to a part of, of the cities are supported by, uh, like Berlin, for, with the energy agency or by facilitating agencies in general. And all together we, we are 11 partners and um, we have European funding from the Horizon 2020 program for that, which is about 1.8 million. A um, lot was said about why, why the cities actually have to do something there, so I, I won't repeat um, that, that the challenges of the growth, but what is clear is what we are building now will be there in 2050. So um, we better do something which already serves the decarbonization strategy and not only half serves the decarbonization strategy. Um, what I might, might do want to add in addition is that um, our dear EU energy markets, uh, liberalized energy markets, um, have some issues um, with, the, uh, with which the cities have to cope right now. And this is, um, it was also mentioned before, we are very short term sighted now in our decision making. We have energy, electricity prices, gas prices, which are hard to compete with um, renewable or alternative energy solutions, which have upfront a high investment costs and, and may, uh, their benefits on the running side and on the maintenance side. But, uh, but if we do nothing, we have done very good regulation on the building side. The building side is well covered, but how the connection of building with energy supply actually isn't, uh, hasn't been thought. And whatever goes beyond the building level is where we need to come in with better planning um, to have the two things fitting together. And that's why we say there is a big need for really integrating energy planning into the special, in the ter territorial planning of cities. To see what we're dealing with, we try to combine all the urban uh, development plans, all the actual urban development plan in the region, and combine them into one map. And normally you thought, well, if this is the map in, uh, of the region, it fits. Well, then we're ready. 
we're already done and we can do something else. But that, not, that is not the truth, of course. That's not how it works. What you see is when you do it alone, thinking about energy transition, thinking about issues as urbanization, thinking as issues as soil subsidence, which is a big issue in our region, you, doesn't come, you don't come to any solutions. We learn two things from that. First of all, we have to show we're all dealing with the same issues. It's not an issue of one community on its own. It's our common problem. And second, it's an integral issue. It's not only about energy transition. It was also about tourism, a totally different function. But for a tourist attraction, as Katwijk is, as Leiden is, it's just as important because it's our econo economic basis. So you have to look at all the different issues to actually come to solutions. And what helps is that the uh, 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 government of the Netherlands, they introduced uh, a new law, a new environmental law, in which an integral instrument uh, was uh, 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 placed, the integral uh, development plan. And we thought, well, that's the perfect instrument for us, of course, because it's new. It also creates urgency. It's all about urgency, as you can hear. And that might help us. And then what you'll see is, well, what was stated before, we saw the same thing. Municipalities, governments like ours, and, well, one of the questions I had today, well, are we unique as the Netherlands in that, but I hear we are not unique. Working together with that uh, isn't easy. Most of my time during the work uh, is bringing people together, actually creating a common interest, creating common sense of urgency. People from the Department of Infrastructure have to work with the Department of, of Housing, have to work with the Finance Department, and they're not used to working together. They make a heat fission or they make a retail fission. But bringing those subjects together, that's entirely new. The uh, building sector in Tel Aviv Yafo is in charge of 67% of greenhouse gas emissions. Also, uh, as, since we are a part of the Forum 15, we are committed to reducing 20% of greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2020, which is tomorrow. And it's only 20%, not 80 and not 60, only 20. Uh, while knowing that the suggested energy production is going to triple itself to 1.2 gigawatts. So we have a three-way action plan, which is uh, uh, combined of these three energy management plans, energy production plan, energy efficiency. A few years ago, a research study was published named The Greenest Building, Quantifying the Environmental Values of Building Rears. The conclusions of the study were clear. The, mo the more sustainable and greener course of action was to retrofit an existing building rather than building a new, a new building, no matter how green it will be. Since there are lo no laws that require, in Israel, of course, we have no laws that require green building or green retrofit of existing buildings, and there is no monetary support and no governmental support, we had no retrofits. We had no pilot projects to prove our point. This is exactly the, the, the situation in Israel, because there are no laws. On the contrary, the all laws, regulations, and standards encourage new construction, and thereby we keep demolishing buildings for no apparent good reason. But we do have a conservation law. And I talked for, to some people around in the audience in the intermission, and uh, well, the, the face I got was, we don't really like you people. The conservation people are considered to be very uh, fanatic and uh, very not cooperative. 
But I have to tell you that we found out that conservation is the most effective legal mechanism for enforcing the reuse and retrofit of existing buildings, especially in Israel, since this is the power we have in our hands. So the combination between sustainability and conservation becomes the leverage for retrofitting of buildings. The conservation department, since most of the buildings are privately owned and there is no governmental support or subsidies for conservation works, the conservation department has numerous and diverse uh, mechanisms at our disposal in order to promote conservation works. We have physical incentives, we have grants and loans, we have a transfer of development rights, and we even have an execution support system, the one that Itai has mentioned before. And so these mechanisms can easily be implemented on the green retrofit of all these international and eclectic style buildings we are preserving anyway. We have at the top, I will say, the strategy for a fossil fuel free Stockholm 2040. And that's very important for us that it is fossil fuel free. Uh, then we have an, an environmental program and in this program, we have calculated exactly what do we have to do and when to come to that. And we did that together also with the politicians, so they should understand exactly what is this about. Uh, and then in the environmental program, we have really detailed uh, calculations, what we should do year by year, so we really know that we can do this. this. And then, finally, in the budget, they write in exactly what every department has to do. And if we look at the environmental program, what do we have there? Well, uh, then we have said we should be fossil fuel free 2040. It means that 2019, in the end of that, we should be at 2.3 tons maximum CO2 per uh, per capita, uh, per person, 2020. And we have to make energy efficiency in uh, the buildings that we own ourselves. And that is very good. We, we own about 10% of all buildings in, in, in Stockholm, uh, 10 million square meters around we own ourselves. But it's a, a challenge to really do things in, in, in this building. So we, we do it together with the private sector. We make seminars, we discuss together with them. What can we do with the existing buildings? What is the best technique? How can we do it uh, in the best way? So we both learn, not only we in the city, even the uh, the other private sector can learn the same and we can learn from them. We established the so-called energy saving partnership in Berlin, which is a role model for some others. Uh, and the main, yeah, let's say, um, um, system on the financial, financing behind that is that there is a, normally a saving reached in 99% of all cases I know, the, the promised savings are fulfilled and a share of the savings is directly, let's say, reserved for the financing of the whole investment which has to be done at the beginning, of course, and has to be done via, normally via uh, the ESCO, in some cases, I know, especially in the United States, they do not finance via the ESCO, they are financed directly in some other European states as well. But uh, this is not, from my personal point, the, the most important point. The most important point is that an ESCO is there to guarantee the lowering of the energy demand, because this is related as well to the cost benefit at the end of the day. Let me point out that the driving forces for all energy services I know worldwide is that political decision makers, especially 
regarding the, the public sector have to take the responsibility. If they don't, we do not have so much or no energy services. So our job as energy agencies, for example, is to help them to make a good decision in this phase. A reliable legal framework, yes. As I mentioned, Monaco. In that case, we as advisors had the, the task to help them to adapt a little bit the legal framework. But normally, I often heard that in, in several countries, first, that they mentioned, oh, energy service to integrate in the public sector is not possible because of public procurement. This was the same we heard in 1996 in Berlin. We have to overcome these obstacles, and it's possible. Sustainable energy at the top of the political agenda. I've been in the Commission since 98. Uh, never ever have I seen so much priority given to energy efficiency and renewable energies. It's really at the top and we know that cities can play a major role. Uh, this is really obvious from what we heard uh, today. There is a big funding available at EU level for activities related to low carbon economy. It, the, the budget uh, have really increased. I mean, energy efficiency, for instance, 18 billion in the structural funds. It's three times more than it used to be in the previous programming period, but it's in all programs like this. More and more, the money is being used in the form of financial instruments so that the, uh, in a revolving manner so that the money can be invested and then there can be a return which can then be reinvested in new projects. That's a better use of public money, we believe, and we estimate that there will be more of this kind of use of money in the future programming period. But uh, let's not forget as well that with all the best practices and success stories that we've had uh, in the previous programs, uh, we can also achieve uh, investments in cities without the uh, EU support. I mean, and the EPC is a good example where ESCOs can help uh, set up the, uh, the financing of, of certain projects. And I think that the Mayor this morning also mentioned that the that cities are committed in many cases to invest their own budget in this kind of measures. So EU support is limited compared to the challenge that is ahead of us.